My name is Dr. Ivy, and I'll be introducing your speaker. Those who are in my class, there will be a sign-up sheet coming around, just so I know that you're men and women of your word and that you actually came. Although I know you are already. This is just <laughs> to ease my my uh, my angst. So this afternoon we have a very close dear friend of mine, Dr. Shelby Wilson from Morehouse College, speaking on a quest to cure cancer with math. Dr. Dr. Uh, Wilson and I go back 10 years. We were just talked about this. She was my graduate assistant when I did my first summer REU in math. So she can uh, she can describe my brilliance. Is that date me? Uh, I feel like that dates me. <laughs> <laughs> we both drown. But does she take some responsibility? She, she, she does take some responsibility in the brilliance that my kids get to see on a daily basis. No. Uh, so, without any further ado, Dr. Wilson, a quest to cure cancer with math. Hey, so hello everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Ivy, for the invitation. It's uh, been a great day up here in West Point. Apparently the weather is amazing for New York. Uh, I'm from Georgia, so it's kind of always like this, but uh, I'm glad you guys enjoy it. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my career in math biology and specifically in an area called mathematical oncology. So I study how math can help us understand cancer and cancer treatments and how bright-eyed and bushy-tailed I thought that I could cure cancer with math. Clearly I haven't because we're still struggling with the disease, but I'll tell you what progress we have made. Just a little about, bit about myself. My, um, I'm from Milledgeville, Georgia, it's in the middle of nowhere, Georgia. Um, I actually went to Georgia Military College Prep for high school, graduated, I won't tell you the year. Um, left there and went to Spelman College, so this is an all-women's college in Atlanta, Georgia. Majored in mathematics and computer science. Left there and did my PhD at the University of Maryland College Park. So I spent six years in College Park. And there's a few, a few women in here. So in between that, I did a program called EDGE. So the EDGE program is a program for women who are getting ready to start PhDs in mathematical sciences. It, is, it was immensely, immensely, immensely helpful to me. So. Shout out to the EDGE program, look into it if you might be interested. After my PhD, I left and moved to France. So I lived in Grenoble, France, it's in the French Alps in southern France. And I mostly just like to put the picture of the mountains there because the mountains were gorgeous. So I spent a year and a half there and then decided that it was time to come home. And so for the past three years, I've been working at Morehouse College in Atlanta. This is an all male, historically black college about 2,000 students and a few notable alumni there, of course, our, our crown jewel is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. graduated from Morehouse College. Um, okay, so tell you a little bit about the link between math and biology because people ask me, what is it that I do particularly and what is it that in general a mathematician can do to help biology? So in general, what I, the easy way to explain what I do is that me sitting at a computer with a Dell is much cheaper than a lab with mice, with cancer, with chemotherapy, and all of these things. So typically, math running simulations of experiments is much less expensive than actually running experiments themselves. Also, the biology can um, inspire interesting mathematical problems. So for instance, we have problems like dimension reduction, um, statistical parameter estimation. So there's lots of areas that Biologists need us to do that requires us to generate new mathematics, new mathematics for them. And also, math can consider things that are outside of the realm of biology. So for instance, if we want to study things like HIV, obviously you can't infect people with HIV, but on a computer in a simulation, that's something we can do. For instance, we can also simulate single point uh, genetic mutations, which at this point is not possible in a biological lab. So, Huge, huge, huge field. You can look at it from many, many different areas. So there's, um, you'll hear people talk about biostats. It's a very hot field right now. There's probabilistic methods. There's agent-based models. And you can start on the biological scale down from genes and genetics all the way up to epidemiology, like the spread of malaria and things like that. So where I sit, let me see if this is working. Nope. Okay. So where I sit is, is over here. So I typically use differential equations and dynamical systems, and I work at the intracellular level. So I look at whole, cell, whole cells and how they interact with each other to create macro phenomena. 
Um, just as a brief history of cancer and cancer research, turns out we actually knew that cancer was a genetic disease in 1890. It's been a long time that we've known that. Um, we knew about the link between smoking and cancer in 1950. Um, we started to understand the genetics of cancer starting in the early 90s. And kind of where we are now are these targeted cancer therapies. And what it does is it kills cells that are rapidly dividing. Yes, cancer cells are rapidly dividing, but so are hair cells, so are stomach cells, so are lots of other cells. So that's why the side effects of chemotherapy are so devastating, because actually the, the medicine itself are, is not targeting the cancer, it's targeting any cell in your body that's rap, uh, rapidly dividing. So now for this, uh, basically for this millennium, we've been working on treatments that target specifically cancer cells and not some of the other cells, hopefully to minimize some of the side effects of the treatment. In general, Cancer requires multiple malfunctions. So it's not just like one thing goes wrong and then you have cancer. What happens is that lots of signals have to go wrong, which is typically why you tend to get cancer later in life. Um, I'll do, talk about two of these now. So for instance, the induction of angiogenesis, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but that is the growing of blood vessels. So cancer can grow their own blood vessels and supplies their own nutrients and energy and things like that. And also cancer has some pretty sophisticated ways of avoiding your immune system because that's what your immune system is there, is to kill things that go wrong. Um, cancer has some sophisticated ways of, of avoiding that. Okay, so my PhD project is fighting cancer by enhancing the immune system. So this is uh, Hanahan and Weinberg. They made uh, something called the Hallmarks of Cancer. These are 10 characteristics that, that are characteristic of cancer. And where we're sitting here is avoiding immune destruction. So we're going to try to make cancer more obvious to your immune system so that your own immune system can fight uh, the cancer that's in your body. OK, so there's a huge field that's immunotherapy, so modeling immunotherapy with differential equations. I won't go too much into this, but essentially, this is how your immune system works. So you have, it actually doesn't have to be a cancer cell. It could be a virus or a bacteria. You have something called antigen-presenting cells. What it does is it bites off a piece of whatever's bugging you, and it shows it to a helper T cell. The helper T cell sends out signals. It says, hey, something's going wrong. And then you, that sends out the signals to these things called effector T cells. The effector T cells go on and uh, kill whatever the, the problem is. So essentially, you can target any step in this, right? So you can put more of these antigen-presenting cells here, you can put more helper T cells, you can put more cytokines, or more of these killer T cells. And the idea is that basically you inject the organism, if it's a human or a mouse, with one of these things, and hopefully, hopefully, it helps your um, immune system to recognize your cancer cells. Okay, so I'm not gonna go too much into detail about the math, but this is, our differential equations, so one, two, three, four, five, so a system of five nonlinear ODEs. Um, these model the tumor size, the TGF beta, so this is an immune suppressor, their effector T cells, so these are your killer T cells. Um, you have regulatory T cells, so these are cells that are important in stopping your immune reaction, and we have a vaccine. So again, so the tumor grows, it makes TGF beta, the TGF beta stops your immune cells from being able to see the tumor, and the regulatory T cells stop the um, cytotoxic cells from working. So essentially what we're doing is we're modeling what happens if you inject more of the killer T cells and if you reduce the amount of signals that suppress the immune system. So both of these things. So we're saying, hey, here's more cells to work with, and also, we're going to ca um, cancel out some of the, the proteins that are floating around that tells your immune system to, to not work. Um, just a quick model simulation. So you have the control case, which is the blue line here. Uh, these two lines here are the two cases when you're given one of the treatments each. And then just here at the very bottom, there's a dashed pink line of what happens when you combine the treatment. So the moral of the story is, hey, one treatment isn't good enough, but if you combine the two together, again, if you stop the suppression signals 
and boost the immune system, then you can get rid of the cancer. Um, for my for my dynamicists in the audience, so there's two positive steady states. There's one that's the no tumor, so if there's no tumor, then you're good to go. There's also the tumor escape, so if the tumor grows as large as possible, in which case is the worst case scenario for, um, for our patient. In general, the two treatments work very differently. So one of them gives you kind of a long-term control of your tumor. The other one gives you kind of a short-term boost. And the idea here is that more or less you would have to get treatment forever. And actually, if you look at what's happening now in biology, is that there are some approved immunotherapies out there. So there's interferon gamma for leukemia. They're treating people with leukemia with that now. And the idea is that as of right now, you have to be on treatment for your lifetime. Our model shows the same thing. Um, what can math tell us that biology might not is that what we predict is that what these things do is they make your tumor more sensitive. So that's different than just shrinking the tumor, which is a good thing, right? We want the tumor to go away. But for instance, if you're in the no treatment phase, look at this scale. The scale is from 224.75 to 225. So these are very minor changes with respect to all of these different types of treatments. So each color is a different level of treatment. What happens once you have the treatment, this is a log scale here, right? So this is uh, a final tumor size of the surface area of 100 millimeters squared. This is 10 to the minus 5 millimeters squared. And so you see that the difference in the tumor scale is incredibly different when you're in the treatment side. So it's not just that the tumor, that the treatment makes the tumor smaller, it's that the treatment makes the tumor more sensitive. It makes it sensitive to what happens in the outside environment. Again, in this case, you're in a case where it's not sensitive at all. No matter what you do, your tumor is always somewhere on the order of 225 meters per second. Here you have the possibility of having a very small tumor or a very large tumor. Um, so in general, the model works. It ca captures the qualitative characteristics of each of the treatment scenarios. We actually compared this with data, mouse data that came from Masaki Terabi, who's at the NIH. Um, and we were able to identify the, uh, the key parameters that are key, the parameters that are key to the biological mechanism. So those are these here. So these are the A1, which is the tumor growth. This is the rate of TGF beta being made, these things like that. Um, and then the question becomes, is it that simple? So again, I got my PhD in May of 2012. So a year before I got my PhD, in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2011, there's um, uh, an article where some biologists cured a guy who had leukemia by giving them T cells. So again, these are the immune cells that, that help you help you uh, fight off cancer. So it works, right? Everybody's happy. We give you T cells, you can fight cancer, we cure cancer. So you got three patients versus the model. So one, so focus on the solid black line. So one patient wasn't cured at all, three patients. Okay, so we have a math model that can show that when the tumor grows up to infinity, fine. We've got one pa pa patient who was cured. So you go to a certain point, you give the treatment, you give the treatment, tumor goes away, life is good. So we're like, okay, great, like we can do this too. Turns out one of their patients died. If you give someone too many T cells, their immune system loses control, they die. So the thing is, is that we as mathematicians, as much as I like to think that we can cure cancer with math, we don't deal with things like toxicity. We don't deal with things like, um, I mean, the patient is sick, the patient is fighting cancer, right? So. It turns out that it's more difficult, and it can't just be give more drugs, it'll cure the cancer. And it turns out in most math models, if you give more drugs, you'll cure the disease. The problem is, is that in real life, you kill the patient in the meantime. Okay, so it turns out that it really is hard to cure cancer with math. And this is where I left and went to France. Why did I go to France? Because I got a postdoc offer from a guy who said, hey, we're gonna hire you as a mathematician, but we've got a budget for you to design your own experiments, mouse experiments. And so you've got 100 mice, you tell us what, what you want done with the mice and we'll do it. I don't know how to do an experiment, I'm a mathematician. Never taken even an undergraduate biology class. Everything I learned came out of a book. 
but they said, hey, we have this budget. We can pay someone to do the experiments that you want. Let us know. So I'm excited because now I can deal with real data. Now I can deal with things like toxicity. I can deal with things like subject death and things like that. And so this is where I went to in Rhea. So now in the realm of our hallmarks of cancer, our treatment that we're focusing on is this down here, inducing angiogenesis. And again, angiogenesis is the process by which tumors make blood vessels. So if you have a small tumor, two to three millimeters, it's fine. What happens is, is that this tumor starts starving to death, more or less, and it sends out distress signals. So it sends out distress signals, and those distress signals causes blood vessels to infiltrate the tumor. And those blood vessels then supply the tumor with all the blood, the oxygen, the nutrients that it needs in order to proliferate. So essentially, anti-angiogenic drugs, what it does is it stops that. It says, hey, no new, more, no new blood vessels, and it doesn't make the tumor smaller per se, but what it does is it stops the source. So it stops the, the ability of, um, of the oxygen and things to get to the tumor. So this is a new target that people are working on in cancer treatment. So the problem is, is that it has a twofold attempt, a twofold consequences. Destroying the vasculature sounds good. Hey, cut off the supply. Turns out if you kill all the blood vessels, and you also can't get chemotherapy to the tumor either, right? Like, if oxygen can't get there, neither can, can any other drug. So it slows the tumor growth, but it also decreases your ability to get other drugs to the, to the tumor. And that's exactly the type of games that mathematicians like to play. It's called optimization, right? How do we balance the consequences, the advantages and consequences of, of two different outcomes? So, this is our median data here. So like I said, I chased the data, chased it across an ocean. So we have 75 mice. These have uh, colorectal cancer. Um, I don't think I explained what each of these are, but essentially we've got one control group. We've got one that was given just regular chemotherapy, one that was giving the drug that um, reduces the ability to make blood vessels, and we have two different combinations of those. So five groups, so control, chemotherapy, just the um, anti-blood vessel drug, and then two combinations of those. And our idea was to model this and to try to make predictions for future experiments. <clears throat> okay, so again, we want to model our data. We want to assess whether these two drugs interact with each other. If they interact, do they interact positively or negatively? And we, most importantly, we want to be able to predict for future experiments. Okay, so again, another ODE, ordinary differential equation model. The model looks like we have an equation that models how your vasculature, how your blood vessels are changing. We have a model that models the bulk of the tumor. And we've got two drugs. We've got chemotherapy that's here with the C. And what chemotherapy does is it kills the tumor directly, right? It kills, it kills tumor cells. And we've got this drug here, call it S. And what that does is it makes the blood vessels die. So the S drug works directly on the blood vessels. The chemotherapy works directly on the tumor itself. And hopefully we hope that this, this, this thing can model our data. Um, another important goal with this project was to move towards individualized medicine. So yeah, this is a long story. So the thing is, is that medical doctors do the best that they can and of course, when you're doing things with humans, you have to give people the best treatment that you can to try to save their lives. So you'll see a lot of graphs that are like this, like, oh, here's my data points and here's a line through the data points with averages. Ideally, what we would want is we would want to be able to take a patient, look at them, and say, hey, your tumor's growing at this rate, so we'll give you this treatment first, but this other guy's tumor is growing at this rate, so we'll do this different treatment at this different dose. So, in general, we want to estimate models, estimate parameters for our model, not only that take into account our averages, so these are the types of things that you'll get with least squares, really, it's not nice, but it's, it's not too difficult to get a line to go through data points, through an average set of data points. It's, it's just not. So, but the idea is, is that we also want to have our parameters with some probability distribution so that hopefully we can account for the individuals as well. So we want a line not only to go through our averages, but we also want to be able to say, hey, again, these are mice, for this mouse, 
we think you should do this or this other thing, which means that we have to be able to model each individual animal. Okay, so more importantly than getting the graph on the left, which like I said, is not super difficult, we get graphs like the ones on the right. So these are typical graphs. I didn't even choose the best ones in that we get graphs where we have lines that go through the data for each specific mouse. And so this process is how we got these parameters. It's called the stochastic approximation, SAEM, stochastic approximation to the expectation maximization algorithm. Lord have mercy. Um, so this was another big thing. So not only do we want to target only cancer cells, but we also want to be able to target our treatment specific to our patients, which means that it's not good enough to get lines through averages because no patient who has cancer thinks that they're average, right? Okay, so the SAM algorithm. So this is an algorithm that was uh, developed by Mark Laviel and the Papix research team that uh, works in Paris. Really interesting guy, but okay. So, but this pack, there's packages for this that are available in Monolix, which is their package, um, MATLAB and R. So essentially what this does, oh, I don't have the thing here. Essentially what this does is it gives you two sets of predictions. It gives you number one, parameters for your averages. Oops. Sorry. So it gives you parameters for your averages, but it also gives you param parameters, di probability distributions for each of your parameters such that you can choose parameters for each individual, hopefully making you able to uh, make predictions for each individual. Obviously, this is super important if you want to make treatment plans for each individual, would be to have a model that works for each individual. Okay, so in general, put this up here for, for, for my math crew here, is that it works, it converges. The algorithm works, it converges, and Mark and his team have been working for many, many years to prove more or less that under most conditions that it converges, it takes a very long time, but the algorithm converges and gives you a set of valid parameters. Um, so, I have a question. Yes, yeah, sure. What do you measure to just differentiate the different months? What's the so the, the data itself or for the, for the parameter estimation? Well, for the data itself, like what you measure something about the months, yeah. and then based upon that, you come up with a customized Model. Right. And what is the data? So what the data is, is that we have a mouse, we inject them with, I think, I believe it's 10,000 cells on day one. You come back a week later and they develop a tumor on their, on their flank and you get three measurements. You get a length, a width, and a height for, of, the, um, of the tumor. So, and then we take a geometric average of those and so we multiply them all together and raise it to the one third power. Why? Because it's not a sphere. Um, so if it was a sphere, you could just kind of take the average tumor diameter but we take the geometric ones and account for the fact that the height, the, how it sticks out is much less than the length and the width. Also, a major dis, which I usually get in the biology, uh, in the math world is like, why do you use the mean tumor diameter? Why do you not use volume? And the deal is, which actually I was really proud of our work at this group, that they actually work with radiologists. Radiologists measure tumor diameter. So if we develop if we as a field of math biology spend all of these years developing models of tumor volume and a radiologist can't use it, it's not very helpful. So they use mean tumor diameter. Yes, we might be able to convince them to use different measures of the diameter, but at the end of the day, however many hundreds of years of medical science is based on tumor diameter. So you need to give them a tumor diameter before they'll even let you in the door. Um, the other thing is, which I didn't explain too much about the experiment, but essentially it was a question of can we predict? So more or less the blue bars are bars from a secondary experiment. So we did the same experiment again. And the red line is what comes out of our model. Yeah, let's, well, I'll mostly leave it at that. So more or less what happens is that we have a model that we can repro reproduce because a lot of what happens for us is that we get data from a biologist because we're begging for data because we don't know how to get our own data. We come and we get a model and we get a model and we're like, hey, we're great, we're done, publish it. Well, we were lucky enough again because of this structure that we actually had money to pay for a follow-up experiment. So once we had our model, we paid someone. We're like, hey, here's another however much money. 
can you please redo this experiment under these conditions? And so we had them redo, and we were very happy to see that our model actually aligned with the new data as well. Um, the next question is, how do we combine the two drugs? So again, I mentioned two drugs. This is what's called an optimal control problem. Um, so it's essentially, how do you minimize the tumor size with respect to the combination of both of your drugs? Do you give all of the one drug at one time, all of the second drug, or do you alternate them? Do you, all types of questions. So this is what's called the optimal control problem. That's what we're working on now. And basically the model works. The model works in this context and um, we were very happy about that and hope to be able to translate it into, um, into humans later. So what are we doing? Multi-scale modeling, so modeling from cells up to cancers. Mixed effect modeling, this is the parameter estimation that I mentioned. And combining drug therapy, this is a really important thing because it's difficult, it's not the type of thing that you can experiment with in a clinic. Um, and now just to finish with a short and shameless plug, Mathematically Gifted in Black. So me and my friends, Candace Price, who actually worked here, when did she leave? Uh, two, years two, years ago. Ago. two years ago. So Candace Price is, uh, whew, she's spearheaded and I just grab onto her coattails and do what she tells me to do. But she, we have started this website that is called Mathematically Gifted in Black. So it is, as you know, it is Black History Month. And what we're doing is, is that each day in this month, we're almost done, we're down to the 23rd, that we're highlighting a black mathematician in the country who does something awesome and a little bit about them and their story. So we've got world-class researchers. You've got like Arlie Petters there who's at Duke, Trishette Jackson who's at Michigan. We've got young stars in the field. So those are our Saturdays. So that's Mo Omar, Talia Mayo, Ryan Hine, and I can actually spill the beans. Chelsea Walton will be our highlightee on Saturday. It was just announced that she got a Sloan Fellowship. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, we have leaders in outreach, so Sylvia Bozeman here on the 7th, she's the one who did the EDGE program that I mentioned, responsible for over 100 PhDs to women in mathematics. You got uh, leaders of institutions, you got Kai Campbell, who is our provost at Morehouse, Freeman Hebrowski, who's the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. You've got government employees, where is Carla Cartwright, she's at the... Uh, Social Security uh, Office, there's a few others. And you got industry leaders, so for instance, like here's Kim Woodson Barnett, who's the COO of Delta Decisions LLC. So it's been really fun, it's been a, a labor of love. If you can, check out the website, www.mathematicallygiftedinlife. You would be very, very surprised, number one, that we exist, because things happen, like I picked up my rental car last night, and I'm like, I'm a math professor. They're like, you're a math professor? I was like, a math professor. <laughs> there are math professors who look like me. We're here. We exist. We're not mythological creatures. And just to learn a little bit more about what we are, where we are, what we're doing, and what areas we are impacting this country. And with that, I will say thank you very much for your attention and ask you if you have any questions. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs> so we have time for a few questions. Please, none about the mysterious rash that you may have. There's no matter. <laughs> right. Not a medical doctor. Yeah. Ma'am, so you mentioned the two drugs here, but um, there, um, you mentioned radiology and chemotherapy and a few others. Um, so would modeling for combinations of those, including those treatments, is that just this, uh, uh, a problem of like funding and then computation, finding a computer big enough to solve those? So, number one, computer issues are, it's hard, it, like, it, the, the, like for instance, like the SAM algorithm I have, it takes about a day to run and that's on a really small data set. There are a whole, so there's Ursula Ledzowitz who's at University of Illinois, University of Southern Illinois, who all she does is optimization of combinations of treatments, right? She doesn't care what kinds of combinations they are, you give her a model with two, with two, two treatments, it can be surgery, it can be radiology, it can be chemotherapy, it can be any of these. And she does exactly the optimal control problem that I showed you at the end. So there's lots of people who are working on this because it's actually, it's a very hard math problem. So it's nice because mathematicians get excited about it and they don't care about any of the applications. They're like, oh, this is a hard math problem. I like to solve math. But at the same time, if you get a solution, it helps the biologists as well. 
Yes. On the first one we showed, um, mm -hmm. you said that the more drugs you give, the math shows that will always go to <laughs> zero mm -hmm. size. Is there, in science or in math, does it show that? Is there a point where tumor is too big where drugs don't affect it? Um, so, it depends on the model, but as a property model, yeah, more or less, right? So essentially, if the tumor is growing so fast, and yeah, so if the tumor is growing way too fast, it kind of, it'll matter for a little while. So yes, you'll see like a little blip and it'll go down for like a second or two or something and then it'll go back up. It does reach what we call out of control. So it's like out of, out of control of any, kind of anything that we can do. But essentially at the end of the day, that's kind of what I was saying with the, with the biology experiment is that it's math. At the end of the day, if you put something negative big enough in front of it, it'll go down, right? Like, the question is, is that yes, me as a mathematician, I can say negative a million, okay, negative 10 million, okay, negative 100 million. Eventually it'll work, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to something in real life. And our goal is to stay in within real life, but you actually want to answer real life questions. Yes, sir. Excuse me, man. Uh, in the beginning of your slide, you talked about uh, being injected with T cells to sort of combat these proteins mm -hmm. so they can go in and they can fight the cancer at the source there. Uh, what's the best way to model that T cell efficiency? Because what I was thinking is if the T cells are just sort of reducing this protein that's telling the body not to kill it, this infected cells, <coughs> what's going to stop the T cells from attacking maybe less harmful cells or maybe attacking the helpful cells in the body? So that absolutely, absolutely happens. And that's kind of what happened in the one who was killed, right? Like in, this, in the patient that was killed. Is that if you give too many T cells, it gets a, it's, a, it's a very, very delicate balance. The good thing, there are lots and lots of checks and balances in your, is that there are, there, I didn't talk a lot about, but we'll get there. There are these things called regulatory T cells. These regulatory T cells are incredibly, incredibly important to keeping your immune system from going out of control, right? Like, I have a cold right now. Like, if you have a cold, yes, I have lots of T cells floating around. That's what's making me sneeze, cough, whatever. Eventually, those need to go away. They can't just hang out in my body until I die, right? Like, something needs to kill those things off. The regulatory T cells are exactly what does that. So you kind of, your body kind of has, if there's too many T cells, your regulatory T cells will go and actually start killing the good T cells. So, they'll, they'll, so there's, there's a balancing act that happens there, hopefully, to save your life. Hopefully. <laughs> That's the goal. Yes, sir. So my my prop, my question is about uh, the nature of this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we think of biology as more interdisciplinary, very very integrated, mm -hmm. and some parts of physical science are more reductive or multidisciplinary. In other words, you can separate them out and kind of piece them together later. Right. I think you've learned lots of biology, obviously. Right. 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 Uh, and unfortunately, didn't have that early in your undergraduate, mm -hmm. but you've had to make up for it. Would you call this, well, do you think of this as more, are you kind of a collective group that can, needs to in some sense connect in all these areas and have knowledge in other fields in order to be effective? That's kind of what I'm asking. Or is it, or is this work more multidisciplinary and you can kind of just say, I'm the mathematician Please so I would say it depends. So I actually, when, when I got overseas, I struggled with this because they, they, I sat in a group. I was the mathematician in the group. I sat with a pharmacist. I sat with two pharmacists. And there was one master student who was also a mathematician, um, which is part of why I came back. So the thing is that at the end of the day, I'm a mathematician. I like doing math, right? Like, so it's fun to learn all the biology. And actually, by the way, it was fun to learn that data is dirty, right? Like, it's fun to, it was, it was fun to learn that, like, I don't know, that if you get somebody to measure something in August in France, it doesn't get done correctly, right? Like, people take vacations. Um, but what I like to say is, is that if you ask me what kind of mathematician I am, I would say, I pick a biological problem and I use the math and I find the find the math or discover the math or create the math that is needed. So for instance, like right now with the SAM algorithm, right now it works in ODEs, right now we're in the process of making it for PDEs, right? And so that's that is a mathematical problem that kind of has nothing to do with the application that it came from. Or for instance, like the optimal control problem. I knew nothing about optimal control. Now I have collaborators who work in optimal control and I'm trying to learn. And so then Hopefully, hopefully that will produce new mathematics in that area. 
At the end of the day, I personally like to still have one foot in to answer a biological question. I like to get not too far away from that, but it you can get pulled a little too far into the into the biology. It can happen. It can happen. But I also find that people relate more to the biology, like if you come and give a talk. Yeah. All right. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Before you guys go, I need uh, a few things. One, my students, here's a sign-up sheet right here. Secondly, Dr. Dungan has a, a sheet to, for you to sign uh, so we have a record of the, the pizza. There are extra pizzas back there, so uh, feel free to grab some uh, on your way out. Thank you guys for coming. Let me just fill in, you must sign that sheet. That yes. It's not if you did the pizza. You must sign You have to. Video. Yes. Okay. You're on the trip section.